Hello honeys and welcome back to your weekly edition of the business looking this week at the past of April 14th through April 20th 420A. Just kidding, of course, of course. I do apologize for our Thursday release of this episode instead of a Tuesday. The delay is caused in part by some results of my efforts to find us a sound editor for the pod and also because you may or may not be able to tell I'm especially nasally right now. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. I thought it was a minor head cold, but I was hoping for it to be gone before I started recording. Alas, it does not look like it's going away anytime soon, so here we are recording with it anyway. Please feel free to check our sources with that source doc link in our episode notes. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get started. Beginning with our discoveries and announcements, The Seth MacFarlane Foundation has teamed up with Martin Scorsese's Film Foundation to restore its first ever collection of animated shorts. A quick note, first of all, yes, each foundation is actually called that with the full name. It is kind of annoying to not be able to shorten a headline, but there's not really a way to do it here. The idea here is to curate and restore historically significant animated shorts made between 1920 and the end of the 1940s. Some of the material to be included, for example, include nine shorts from the creators of Betty Boop and Coco the Clown, Max and Dave Fleischer. Plans also include restoration of two stop motions by George Powell, the creator of Puppet Tunes. McFarlane has long been committed to saving animation. He actually began drawing in childhood because of it and has an animation degree from RISD, which is pretty impressive and a thing I did not know. According to the publication Deadline, quote, the films were selected and restored by UCLA Film and Television Archive and the Film Foundation in collaboration with Paramount Pictures Archives. The 12 restorations funded by McFarlane were completed using unique, original, pre-print elements and or print sources, mostly nitrate, held at UCLA Film and Television Archive, end quote. Scorsese himself says, quote, I'm so grateful to Seth McFarlane for his enthusiasm and his support on these restorations. What an astonishing experience to see these remarkable pictures that I experienced for the first time as a child brought back to their full glory. Many art lovers and scholars alike were shocked to discover this last week that art and ephemera once owned by pioneering artist Mary Beth Edelson had been discarded on the street in Soho. Those out for a walk in that neighborhood on April 17th found a treasure pile of the late feminist artist's former belongings. According to Art News, quote, Edelson rose to prominence in the 1970s as one of the early voices in the feminist art movement. She is mostly known for her collaged works, which reimagine famed tableau to narrate women's history. For instance, her piece, Some Living American Women Artists, of 1972, appropriates Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, of 1494-98, to include the faces of Faith Ringgold, Agnes Martin, Yoko Ono, and Alice Neal, and others as the Apostles. For example, Georgia O'Keeffe's face covers that of Jesus, end quote. The discovery was shocking because of not only her fame and the high critical regard for her art historical impact, but to some degree also because of this treatment of her belongings by her own son. The belongings were sat in boxes on the street, most items were free to take, and many found this disrespectful. The gallery holding most of her works, David Lewis in New York, was not contacted about returning the works or ephemera, and art world conservation panic and moral outrage over this situation was not helped by her son viewing his actions in this impromptu giveaway as her last show, in his own words. If anything, this incident speaks to the lack of regard surrounding women artists legacies to this day in sales and auctions related news last week we heard that sotheby's is to offer four paintings by joan mitchell 
in their so-called momentous May auction. Those four paintings will make up some of the offerings during the May 13th contemporary-focused event. All four have been consigned from an unnamed private collection. Mitchell was born in Chicago in 1925, earning an MFA from the Art Institute of Chicago in 1947. Mitchell then became a central figure in the post-war New York School, which was a branch of abstract expressionism. The four pieces to be sold span the artist's career with estimates for them landing anywhere from a million to 20 million. Three quarters of the paintings will be on view at Sotheby's public galleries prior to the sale. Mitchell has been making something of a comeback after a couple of retrospectives in the U.S. as well as an eye-catching, record-breaking streak of sales last November. We care about this, of course, because Sotheby's head of contemporary art, David Galprin, called the offering of the four paintings, quote, a momentous occasion, unquote, for how they chart the development and the evolution of the artist's work over 40 years of her career. Galperin also notes that the selected starting prices for each work are a direct result of how Mitchell has been, quote, really undervalued, unquote, for most of her life and afterwards, in comparison to her male peers and others in the abstract expressionist movement. All in all, this auction and Mitchell's inclusion in it is going to be a sort of historic recognition of her impact, sort of the first time that the price tags will reflect the reality of her importance in art history in multiple senses. A few important fair and event updates. First of all, Jeffrey Gibson's U.S. Pavilion opened to great acclaim at the Venice Biennale. The artist is representing the entirety of the U.S. art scene and is all the more special because he is the first Native American artist to represent the USA at the Venice Biennale. His exhibition within the pavilion is titled The Space in Which to Place Me and includes 11 paintings, 9 sculptures, 8 flags, 2 murals, and 1 video installation. According to reports, there is a strong emphasis on color throughout, often overlaying text onto geometric prints. He also has lots of freestanding figurative sculpture in this exhibition. Art News describes his work as a mixture between elements drawn from his heritage, radical fashion, pointed decorative elements, and text drawn from a variety of sources. All of these elements come together to have an effect which they describe as celebratory and defiant, disquieting, and full of righteous rage. In a bit more of a heartwarming story, centuries-old art weeks were saved last week from Copenhagen's old stock exchange building blaze by passers-by. The fire started Tuesday in the 400-year-old landmark building of Copenhagen, and immediately passers-by stopped their cars, hopped off their bikes, etc., to start helping the firefighters, conservators, and soldiers called to the scene in their efforts to retrieve the paintings before they could burn. Of course, the guards and firefighters, those with equipment, went after artworks in immediate danger from the fire in the parts of the building that were ablaze already, while the non-equipped people rushed for the half of the building that was still not on fire. Although, of course, the common folks helping out didn't do it a curator's ideal way, they still saved a considerable number of works. Of course, there are some pros and cons debates going on about recruiting people walking or working nearby in these efforts, but it's important to note first and foremost that the firefighters were mostly limited to containing the fire, so the extra bodies here were undeniably useful. Plus, we love good Samaritans, especially art Samaritans. 
Ritter summarizes the results of the situation by saying, quote, Some paintings were severely damaged by water or fire or because they were hastily torn off the walls. Conservators are still inspecting the paintings, which were brought to a depot of the National Museum and are trying to get an overview of the damage and what is missing, end quote. All in all, shout out to everybody present there for their th- quick thinking and their care towards artworks. In a headline relating to a previous one of ours regarding the election of a provenance head at the Met, that same institution has returned an ancient Sumerian sculpture to Iraq. The decision was made after an internal review, largely by the provenance research team that we had talked about, because of questions surrounding how dealer of Near Eastern art and specialist Elias David got it before giving it to the Met in 1955. As Artnet says, quote, both Simmons' appointment and the restitution come as the museum, like many others, are facing increased attention from law enforcement and diplomats. Last year saw the Met return artifacts to Italy, Greece, Turkey, China, and Cambodia, end quote. The sculpture itself is a copper alloy figure, which is dated to between 2900 and 2600 BCE, and it depicts a nude man carrying a box on his head. Those details are significant because, as the Met says, quote, only certain categories of people were represented as nude in the early dynastic period. Priests, athletes, mythological heroes, and prisoners of war, end quote. So this figure is in line with norms of scenes depicting priests carrying offerings, and he might be mid-action in that sense. The restitution occurred at a ceremony in Washington, D.C. BBC News also raised awareness of the alarming financial situation facing Welsh museums at this point. The Welsh government's total budget has decreased over 700 million euros since 2021, and as a result, the budget for national, I think, art museums, but it was not entirely clear, has understandably been, as a result, at least 4.5 million euros less. The institutions have been really hard hit by this funding decrease. The Wales Museum system is expected to have to make those 90 hard conversations and likely more after the big recent loss in funding and the deteriorating condition of the Cardiff Museum, especially with electrical and flooding problems, has put it in the danger zone as well, according to the chief executive of the Museum Wales overseeing body. Other likely changes coming to the system are soon to include charging visitors for special events such as tours and exhibitions, closing earlier in the winter, and increasing donation efforts. A pretty obvious question here is why not do paid admissions? It actually would cost them more because of the loss of tax benefits. Although this is a museum system across the pond, we should still pay attention to this situation because it shows how funding deficits matter in museum cases. As the BBC puts it, quote, Conservative culture spokesman Tom Gifford called the museum's situation concerning not just for the individuals who will be impacted, but for all of us. Disproportionate funding cuts are putting the preservation of our shared history, sorry, heritage, at risk, while the Labour Welsh government prioritizes money for more politicians, end quote. While I will make no obvious comment on the last half of that sentence, I absolutely agree with the first half. Disproportionate funding cuts are a serious issue in politics when it comes to the arts. All right, honeys, that is all the time we have this week for the business. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you're doing well. I am excited for another round of Art That Pisses People Off coming soon. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. Stay well. Enjoy our shift into late spring, early summer, and be well. Talk to you all soon. This podcast was created, produced, 
Written, hosted, edited, and fact-checked by master's graduate Celia Bugno. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on all of your favorite streaming platforms as well as your social medias.